Korea's most unique, beloved, and respected voice is largely unheard outside of her home country. As Korea's best-selling female music artist for over 20 years, it's worth asking, why has she been ignored for so long internationally? Her discography spans a massive vocal range, including ballad, jazz, rock, rap, pop, folk, a cappella, bossa nova, and heavy metal. She's filled stadiums and crossed paths with hundreds of celebrities while hosting a decade of weekly live broadcasts. Her tracks debut in popular K-dramas and have even featured K-pop sensation BTS. So who is Isora? What is so special about her music? And why did I spend a year researching this 4,000 word essay? Well, to answer the last question, I'm a huge fan and couldn't find any comprehensive English videos about her. I just wanted to nerd out a bit and share some of her magic with all of you. For the rest, stick with me as I break down each of her albums, trace her career path, and explain why she's so deeply loved by Korean fans and music artists. First, it needs to be mentioned that in English formats, Isora is credited as Lee Sora or Lee Sora. So you need to use that name to find her in online stores. However, I'll be using the original spelling and pronunciation Isora for the rest of this video. Also, small side note, there's a supermodel born the same year with the same name, and both Isoras have hilariously appeared together on occasion. Isora has been singing and writing lyrics since the early 90s, and while she works with a roster of composers, she's directly involved in the creative process. She led production for six of her eight major studio albums, as well as many other side projects. I'll rank each of these albums on a grand tier list while explaining each of them in detail. I'll refer to all of Isoda's songs by their English names while displaying the original Korean titles on screen just for clarity. You'll find handy links and a playlist in the description. All right, so let's get started. The first album for our tier list is her 1995 solo debut, Isora Volume 1. Right off the bat, we've got a godlike A tier album. I'm tempted to put it in S tier, but I need to leave some headroom for future albums that surpass it, and it has a few small flaws that I'll discuss shortly. This album is a perfect introduction to Isora's vocal style, so let's dig into that now. Isora uses a powerful, almost operatic tone. And from the very first lyric of the very first track, Confession, you can tell straight away that she has complete focus and control over her voice. It's deep, sultry, and straight out of a smoky noir scene where all eyes are on the mysterious singer. To top it off, the album's first enrapturing lyrics are, I love you, my dear. It's a simple line, but sung with such confidence and precision that its brilliance can't be overstated. There may be people who dislike Isoda's style, but can't deny this undeniable proof that she's got pipes. The album itself was a Hail Mary for producer Kim Hyun Chul, who discovered Isoda and believed that she possessed truly unique vocal talents. In 1995, a newer style of pop songs had taken root in Korea, but Success for female singers was a revolving door. They decided to buck this trend by backing Isora's thick baritone voice with mostly classical piano and strings, and the gamble paid off. Isora rocketed to fame and became the only female music artist with a million seller album until the girl group Blackpink debuted over 20 years later. In early performances, even Isora looks a little bemused by her own popularity. Breakups are emotionally complicated, but Isoda's voice is famous for cutting to the core and resonating through specific lenses. Doubt, sadness, anger, nostalgia, exhaustion. There's a breakup song for every occasion. I'm Happy was the mega hit from this album and is full of bitter subtext. Despite its achievements, Isora Volume 1 has a few flaws, the biggest of which is the duets. The harmonizing is on point, but the star power of her partners steals the spotlight. In addition, 
duets direct the meaning of the lyrics away from the listener and toward the other singer. So instead of singing I love you to the everyman you, it's actually to the guy who's singing opposite her. Before I move on to the next album, just a quick reminder that you can find links for all these tracks in the video description. Go have a listen to Isora Volume 1 and come back when you're ready for more. After the massive success of Isora's first album, she was thrust into the spotlight and began hosting a late night show called Isora's Proposal. These live weekly broadcasts aired for six consecutive years, and her next three albums all released during this run. The first of these three albums is Like in a Movie, which I'm also putting at a solid A tier. With Isora herself leading the production and writing lyrics for every song but one, the album has less teary-eyed ballads. Several songs have more abstract storytelling, with catchy funk riffs and bossa nova beats. The Hawaiian guitar sets a warm, c'est la vie attitude that invites us to kick back, relax, and go with the flow of love's ups and downs. One of her most well-known and enduring songs, Proposal, comes from this album. It's a cute song about falling in love with someone you just met, and has been reimagined many times over the years. It's also the purest distillation of Isoda's goofy onstage persona. Guests on her late night show would often goad her into fits of laughter by impersonating her deep voice and parts of this song. While almost every track on the album is great, the weakest point is Angry, which marked Isoda's jarring first attempt at a hard rock song. It's an interesting experiment, but neither her vocals nor the backing track reach the energy level she's shooting for. She continued exploring rock much more in her third album, so let's get right into that. About Sorrow and Anger was released two years later and shocked fans with a split format. The front half being a perfection of her classical love ballad style from Isora Volume 1, and the back half, rock opera, thrash metal, and rap. This sense of whiplash didn't sit well at the time, but in retrospect, many fans see this album is Isora's first masterpiece. It's absolutely S tier without a single doubt. Isora's constant onstage presence and accolades built up her self confidence to the point where she could raise the stakes in every aspect of her performances. Her lyrical style mined deeper, darker veins of forbidden secrets, shameful, intrusive thoughts, and unhinged rage. She also ratcheted up the emotional energy in her vocals, hunted by anguish and spitting fire. Literally every track is amazing and deserves recognition, but for the sake of time, let's just cover the ones that deserve extra special, special mention. If you only listen to one song because of this video, listen to Please Don't Go Away From My Side. Even if you don't understand a single word, this song will rip out your still beating heart and it's the perfect example of how Isora channels raw emotion. Blue Sky is an evolution of her lyrics into more abstract and evocative imagery, and Praise is a beautiful ballad about her dedication to perfection through self-sacrifice. All the rock tracks are worth a listen, and are mostly about being a victim of misunderstanding and the desire to evolve and escape the status quo. Isoda pulls no punches to prove that she can come out of her shell and absolutely wail, especially at the end of My Job, where her vocals are at peak metal. It ended up taking 15 years before she returned to hard rock. Instead, the last album of Isoda's late night reign was Flower, with Kim Hyun Chol back at the helm. He pumped this up as a throwback to her older love songs with an orchestra of over two dozen musicians. Many of her past collaborators reunited to write songs that were both grand and intricate. However, despite some standout tracks, I have to put Flower in B tier. 
This is Isoda at her biggest and boldest, with flashy costumes, crowd-pleasing earworms, and jam-packed with more tracks than ever before. Most of the titles are in English, possibly seeking an international audience, and rising star Akko Shin lends his R&B flair on It's Gonna Be Rolling. Amen and her cover of Autumn Gaze are both outstanding, but their classical style was boxing her into a fading brand. The stage persona that had been inflating around Isora had finally outgrown her comfort zone. There's a telling video from this era that featured her sing-along hit, Proposal. Everyone in the audience is dutifully clapping along through the entire song, but she has the exasperated, frozen smile of being trapped in a personal hell. Everything came to a head in early 2001, during a live broadcast of Please. It's a dramatic song about a recent personal heartbreak and begging her lover to not leave. She poured everything into the performance, and it pushed her over the edge. The dam broke, and she couldn't stop crying. She was able to complete the song after three attempts, but it was a shocking moment that no one would ever forget. It's also around this time that she began sitting for the entirety of nearly all her shows. Isora the Diva died along with the end of her show, Proposal, and a new Isora rose from the ashes. From this point forward, Isora began refusing most public appearances and promotions. She still emerged from time to time, but only on her own terms and when it matched her personal ambitions. Mostly, she just wanted to be left alone, rock out with her favorite musicians, and write songs more in touch with personal experiences and vulnerabilities. And so Sora's Diary was her first album along this new trajectory. It was a necessary step, but also a bit of a stumble into B-tier. Although there are still love songs, Isora wrote them from the perspective of someone who had completely given up on love. So they're more like windows into her most cherished memories. If Flower was her biggest, beefiest album, this is her tiniest, frailest album. The overly cute songs like Date and Happy Birthday feel like paper dioramas that could topple over in a light breeze. Even though these songs didn't have broad appeal, it's obvious that they're precious to Isora. Remember the plastered on smile from that proposal video? Compare that to how she lights up while singing First Love. Even after 20 years, singing these songs seems to be her happy place. It was also around this time that she started hosting radio shows, which she preferred over TV because it didn't involve gussying up for the camera. The biggest success out of Isora's newer poetic style is To You Who Doesn't Love Me, a gut-wrenching song about being rejected by her only true love. Its symmetrical structure has a hypnotizing effect that drags the listener deep into her heartbreak and despair. My Nymph is also special for having no lyrics at all and only shaping the eerie mood with her voice. And yet, while many of these tracks tell brilliant and inspiring stories, some are completely spoiled by bizarre mixing choices. For example, on Innocent Child, you can hear Isora gasping between lines like nails on chalkboard. Once you hear it, you can't unhear it. And for everything that went wrong on Isora's fifth album, it went spectacularly right on her sixth, Eyebrow Moon. This is what fans would call her second masterpiece. There might be one or two weak tracks, but it's absolutely S-tier material. This is all of Isora's expertise, experimentation, and partnerships finally gelling into something completely unique while still remaining accessible. It's an album that's so confident and unyielding in its style that it sounds almost effortless. It was also a hit with critics and still tops best album lists to this day. It has what is possibly Isora's most well-known track, The Wind Is Blowing, a timeless anthem that's enjoyed a resurgence in popularity several times since release. 
Similarly, Spring is a ballad that feels so intensely familiar that you might assume it's an old hymn of ancient origin. And while the album's other songs aren't typically singled out, they form a cohesive tide that floods the auditory space and sweeps listeners away into the realm of Isoda's imagination. Her lyrics often twist words of color and natural science into a new language of compound emotional metaphors. Previous albums only let us have a peek into the mythos she'd been building around herself, but this was a full invitation to tour her world of symbols and dreams. Isoda was also praised for her side gig as a recurring sitcom character, but she gave up the role to focus on her radio show. She became more and more reclusive, and even suffered an addiction to World of Warcraft. And while all of her previous albums had released less than two years apart, almost four years quietly passed after Eyebrow Moon. She continued fading from the public eye, and it became a running gag that whenever interviewers asked where she'd been, she'd say, at home. Finally, Isora agreed to appear in a music video for the first time since her debut album. It was an untitled rock ballad about the tragic death of Elliot Smith, a singer-songwriter also born in 1969, who she greatly admired. The brooding atmosphere and her newly shaved head were just the first of many shocks. Following this came an untitled full-length album where all the songs were also untitled. For the sake of reference, it's called Seventh Album, and the songs are simply called Track 1, Track 2, Track 3, etc., with the music video being Track 8. It's also a very different beast from her previous album, but again, an S-tier masterpiece. While Eyebrow Moon is a more consistently excellent modern rock album, this has higher highs and lower lows. Most of the album has a low-key acoustic vibe and, like Sora's diary, tells smaller, intimate stories. In addition to Elliot Smith, it also pays tribute to several legendary poets such as Lord Byron, Yoon dong Chu, and Kim guan Sok. Many songs such as Track 1 and Track 2 feel like you're nestled right in with her band, jamming and enjoying a warm summer night. At the opposite end of the spectrum are the dreary minor key songs like track 4 and track 7 that devolve into repetitive mumbling, perhaps to present songs still in their gestation period. Track 3 was popular for sing-alongs and covers, but the most brilliant is track 11. It's a stunning song about being together despite the vastness of the universe that starts tiny and crescendos into an epic rock ballad. Sadly, the album is shorter than it seems, with track 12 and track 13 being reprises of track 3 and track 1. But they do round out the idea of this album, taking the listener on a journey through the process of writing and rewriting. It didn't make a big splash on release, partly due to the difficulty of marketing unnamed tracks, and Isoda went back into hiding for a few years. All these years of obscurity during the boom of online viewership is one of the biggest reasons she's unknown internationally, but there's still so much more to this story. Isora made a big comeback in 2011 by competing in a singing reality program. She also revived her TV show as The Second Proposal, she even recorded a song called Wow about her persistent gaming addiction. But let's set all that aside for a moment to talk about her final mainline album, simply titled Eight. Remember Isora, the queen of heavy metal? She returned in 2014 to record this badass rock album. It's a little short at only 30 minutes long, but otherwise a nearly flawless entry into A tier. The album starts with I Focus a grand intro with Isoda's voice practically descending from the heavens themselves. Then the drum kicks in, and it's one banger after the next. I'm a Star is the most well-known because it was promoted using sheet music before release, leading to several covers before the original. But every track is expertly written and produced, leaving no nits to pick. Amazingly, among all the heavy riffs, Isoda still performed these from her favorite seated position, 
and compared to her previous rock songs, these are a little more moody, reflecting on loneliness and death while still kindling her independent spirit to defy expectations. Even the minimalist two-tone cardboard sleeve is a complete reversal of her previous two albums, which were handcrafted and bedazzled. And that's it. That's all eight of Isoda's main albums to date. But wait, there's more. Yes, there's still a few extra official albums. First up, My One and Only Love. This 100% English cover album was released between 7th album and 8th. Sadly, it's the first on this list to slide in the C tier. The problem isn't that the lyrics are in English, but that the English isn't executed very well. Isora has a famous reputation for nailing many of her studio recordings on the first take, but here, she's mumbling through the pronunciation and emotionally unplugged from the theme of the songs. And it's a shame, not only because she's done excellent English covers before, but because she's talked about her love of these particular songs many times. Chogyu Chan is listed as the vocal director on this album, and while they've done a lot of great work together, perhaps he wasn't the best choice to sign off on an English recording. Would it make any differences? That said, there are a few good renditions, such as Rainy Days and Mondays, that keep it from being a total loss. And it's also hilarious to picture Isora singing these half-drunk at a Midwestern karaoke bar. Now let's set the Wayback Machine to before Isora's first album. She originally got her start in an a cappella quintet called Unknown People. Their first self-titled album is actually pretty excellent and easily worthy of A tier. It's innovative, catchy, and Isoda's voice really shines through on several tracks. The lyrics are uniquely fun, and she's credited with writing some of them. The producer who discovered her, Kim Hyun Chart, also did production on some of these tracks. And the main guitarist, Go Chan Yong, went on to write funk music for Isoda's first two albums. Then there's two official albums from her early career, Best and Isoda Live. A tier and B tier, respectively. Best is just a compilation of Isoda's hits from the first three albums, so it's a helpful starting point for new fans. It also includes her first breakout hit, The Blue in You. She recorded this duet for a soundtrack, and its explosive popularity led to recording the solo album. The live album is a double album which includes several of her better English covers. In fact, IOU became extremely well known in Korea because of Isoda's cover, and she even invited Carrie and Ron to perform it on proposal, with some awkward results. What is the purpose of visiting Korea this time? I think the purpose is IOU. Because of the big... Uh, let, let him talk. Unfortunately, the overall mastering quality on this album is a little rough. Isoda has teased a ninth album for many, many years, even releasing the single Don't Tell Me It's Not Love. And while the project may have been shelved after five years, she has done an album's worth of singles in that time. If we collect them all together, we can rank them. Let's call it Isoda's single collection, and it's A tier. It's mostly love ballads, but definitely Isoda at the top of her game and the piano and string accompaniments are absolutely gorgeous. One of the most well-known tracks is the pop song, Song Request, which features a small rap interlude by Suga from BTS. Isora has also cameoed on many songs over the years. After collecting them all together, it's sadly going into C tier. These songs take her in interesting directions, but generally don't make the best use of her vocal style, and the duets feel a little off. Outside of official releases, Isoda has covered many English songs by her favorite artists, Sinatra, Nat King Cole, and even Oasis. Let's bring all those together into an album and call it B tier. While the pronunciation and recording quality is a mixed bag, they gain a lot back in crowd energy. There's two very special concert recordings worth mentioning. The first is Spring of Her Wind from 2016. It's an outdoor concert among the stars and serves as a perfect backdrop for the cosmic theme track 11. But there's a few awkward slip-ups, so we'll put it in B tier. 
And second, we have Comforting and Healing, a concert that streamed online due to the COVID pandemic in early 2021. A small classical trio backs her up, and she mostly sings from her recent soundtrack work. But it also includes a new English cover and some of her best known songs. Despite missing a high note in the final moments, it's truly divine and definitely A tier. I mentioned reality TV before. Isora's big comeback was on I Am A Singer. This is where The Wind Blows went from a sleeper hit to a ubiquitous Korean anthem. This show also included some decent covers and a very rare instance of hip hop. These play better in context with the drama on set, but as an album, it's going in B tier. Most recently, Isora appeared on the busking travel show, Begin Again. She pushed herself to try something way out of her element, and the other musicians did a great job keeping her comfortable. There's some really special live performances and Beatles covers. This is A tier. Isora appeared again in a later season of Begin Again, and while she harmonizes great with her duet partners, her perfectionist nature clashed with the show's premise, and she ended up leaving mid-season in tears. B-tier. It's actually sort of a running theme that Isora gets flustered and cries on reality TV. I don't care if I know. <laughs> Although she goofed around a lot on Proposal and has an amazing laugh, you can see how uncomfortable she is on stage by the way she recoils at the slightest touch. <laughs> One of the only exceptions I've ever seen is when she appeared on this cooking show. What the heck is happening here? What is my point? When will this video end? I promise we're almost there. In 2020, Isora agreed to do her very first fashion shoot for a magazine cover. This was another case where she did something out of character to challenge herself, but it's exceptions like this that make the reality so crystal clear. As an admired top singer for decades, you would expect her to have done countless promotions. Commercials, toys, posters, biographies, emoticons, and more, like you see with other Korean idols. There was even a big controversy over a promo album of her performances on Proposal. She rallied fans to boycott the release and eventually had it pulled from shelves. So my point is this. Isoda's unwillingness to engage in conventional promotion is the key reason she isn't recognized internationally. While raw skill has made her a household name in Korea, she has no digestible brand to export. Even Korean interviewers have trouble making sense of her pondering, so how could she possibly manage speaking through an interpreter? Her poetic lyrics are unusually difficult to translate, and the English songs she chooses to cover follow her personal whims rather than targeting international popularity. It's a shame, but at the same time, it's also incredible that she's maintained control over her destiny for so long, even if that just means staying at home. That's all I have for you today. I hope this was informative and perked up a few ears. Don't forget to check out the links to Isora's music in the description. Thanks so much for watching and sticking with this very deep dive. Did you find this interesting, boring, weird? Where did you first hear about Isora and how did you even end up here? Let me know what you think in the comments. Like, subscribe, punch the bell, all that. Bye. Ah. Uh -huh.